Yeah, Yorkies were big and good. That's so small. That's a little gay. Today's video is brought to you by Backblaze, which is a hell of a coincidence because I just bought another Backblaze. Like you have like, you have like each Backblaze subscription goes to each computer and I just got a, another computer. Like I've got two computers now because I'm straight baller and um, I needed a new Backblaze account. So I literally just signed up and I'm sure if I asked them for it, they'd probably give me one for free. But it is such a good deal that I didn't even bother. I was just like, yeah, yeah, the two year plan. Lock it down. You want my card? Boom, we're done. Because what Backblaze offer, I, I, I will get to the talking points person who reviews this at Backblaze. I apologize that the, just this is like my genuine moment of pleasure for your brand um i even forgot what i was gonna say yeah it's such a good deal it doesn't even matter it's seven dollars a month <laughs> which is like it's unlimited backup all of your files constantly syncing to the cloud using this like backblaze control panel that's just always like and you control what speed it goes i was like you could control how many like upload threads it does and i was like i got a lot of data on this computer that needs to go to your servers increase it to 100 threads and that was a bad idea because it <laughs> while it uploads to backblaze super fast it was just like your internet becomes just non-functional i think they recommend like 16 threads so i turned it down to that and the backup was a little bit slower i mean still fast still fast don't get me wrong it's still fast but it just also meant that I could do other things on the internet as well. Uh, you can back up your data from anywhere in the world. Yeah, obviously, I live in Prague in the Czech Republic and Backblaze is available to me. And it uploads like it uploads as fast as my internet allows, which is a painfully slow 21 megabits per second. But that is as fast as I can go. Like it's not Backblaze that are slowing it, it down. It's me, my ISP. It's bad. They're stringing fiber to my building, which I'm very excited about, but they haven't installed it yet. Uh, they've restored over 55 billion files for customers, which is insane. And there's the restore refund program. So you buy a hard drive restore, they mail it to you. You can mail it back in 30 days and get a full refund if you want. I believe you could just pay for it and keep it, which is what I'd do because I'm lazy. Okay, here's a talk. Is this a talking point? They just say NAS they're recently listed on the NASDAQ stock exchange under Blaze, BLZE. Um, which is congratulations. I'm not sure how that's relevant to like consumers, but I just find that's cool that your business is successful because I really, I've used, Backblaze is one of those sponsors that I've actually used since before they were a sponsor, which is great. Um, quick riffable points. This whole ad read has been riffable Backblaze. I hope you like it. Please don't make me redo it. Please audience go get Backblaze and show them that you love them and you love me. Genuinely a great service. Um, just go back up your stuff at backblaze.com slash blaze, backblaze.com slash blaze it's the best just go do it and there's a link below now today's video hello everybody welcome back to another episode of brain blaze as always i am your revered leader simon wammers here one of my writers danny thank you so much danny writes me a script the past was the best <laughs> danny have you been smoking the crack that you've acquired in the past because well that is the only good thing about the past isn't it you know, you just go into the local drugstore, pick up some... Well, normally, I go to the drugstore, I buy some, like, baby food, get some nappies. If I go to the drugstore in, like, 1900, you say, I buy some baby food, get some nappies, get a gram of coke, a little bottle of heroin. Boom! The past was the best, Danny. I take it all back. You're a legend. Yeah! Things that really were best were in the good old days. In my house, at least, nothing. Oh, the, the format of this show, if you're new here, I've never read this before. Danny writes it, I read it, Sam afterwards edits it. It's the holy trinity of Blaze Boys. And, um, yeah, subscribe. Why aren't you already subscribed? I see that unsubscribed, you know, where it's red and not grey below. You fing animal. Get it together! Hit that subscribe button, or I'm coming for you and your family. That's. Don't. Oh, God, I'm definitely. <laughs> That's the sort of you say is a joke, and then the algorithms are like, ah, 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 he's murdering someone's family, he's making death threats. And the next thing you know, you're in Guantanamo Bay. It's unfortunate. In my ass, at least, nothing evokes the spirit of Christmas more than a good old fashioned tin of Quality Street. It's right up there with eating mince pies, quaffing vast quantities of cheap sherry, and vomiting unapologetically into a distant relative's Christmas tree. <laughs> I was like, I mean, Quality Street's definitely, uh, you know, part of Chris, especially when I was a kid. I haven't had them in a long time. Uh, but I used to like that there was a big round one that was like toffee. I think it was called a toffee penny. And it was really good. I, didn't, I wasn't much of a fan because the risk with... Well, it's not really a risk, but there's too many fruit ones. Like, I can't stand fruit chocolate. I think fruit chocolate is for like little Hitlers. You know, what, why? why? 
Like, oh yeah, delicious chocolate. And inside is like a weird, sickly sweet strawberry, like liquid explosion in your mouth. And I'm like, there's nothing about that I like. Nothing. Except for the liquid explosion. <laughs> ah! Sexual chocolate. Sexual chocolate. There's something quite magical about lifting up a big tin of Quality Street and gazing in quiet bedazzlement at the feast of sweets and chocolates, all individually wrapped in sparkly, shiny foil wrappers. It's a different story after Christmas, when the only ones left rattling around the largely empty tin are the crap toffees that nobody likes. Danny, why are you talking about the toffees are the best one? It's the weird fruit explosions in your mouth that no one likes. Or is that just me? Maybe Danny and I will like, we'll get quality streets and then every year we'll swap them. So it's like, I'll eat all the toffees and send Danny all the f***ing disgusting strawberry, like, liquid explosions. And Danny will send me all of the toffee ones. That would totally work, except now there's Brexit. <laughs> it's gonna get stopped at the border. No! I used to order clothes from the UK and I just don't anymore. I used to, I used to do all sorts of and now I'm just like, nah, it's too much of a hassle because I know customs are going to stop it and I'm going to have to fill out forms. And it's like, I'm okay. I don't mind paying the customs duties. I mean, obviously it does make a difference because I'll be like, okay, well, I can buy this locally. But I just don't like all the paperwork. It's such a f***ing pain in the ass. It's ridiculous. And it's like, what do you want? It's a coat, mother It's a coat. It's just a coat. Why? I definitely would never order that to uh, an address in the UK and then just uh, wear it through the airport green lane. I'd never do that. Never. <laughs> Fascinating tangent, Simon. Let's carry on. But imagine the outrage that swept across Britain earlier this year when Nestle announced they will soon be dropping those shiny foil wrappers, which have been a quality street signature since they were first launched in 1936 and replacing them with wrappers made from vegetable-based wax. That sounds kind of gross, to be honest. Well, I'm sure they're like, plastic's ruining the environment! I don't know why I said that sarcastically. Plastic's obviously terrible and ruining the environment. Also, plastic recycling. I'm making a video about this. Actually, a little bit of a secret. I'm working on it. Well, it's not a new channel yet. It's a pilot. So, uh, we've got a pilot episode in the works. You're joking. Not another one? Oh, for God's sake, I can't honestly... I can't stand this. There's actually a channel sort of about business, which is what this channel was initially going to be until it turned into this. And uh, it's like the kind of the, the working title for the channel, which it won't be because I've not looked. Someone probably already has it, but it's like business is behaving badly. And um, the first one is about like plastic recycling. And I'm like, holy sh plastic recycling is a fucking con. Like now I'm just like, I'm just wandering around my apartment. And it's like, yeah, okay, bit of plastic. Throw that in the regular trash. Because if I don't throw it in my trash, and it goes into landfill here, it's going to go in the plastic recycling and just end up being burned in India. And it's like, fuck hell. Have we been lied to about plastic or what? Fuck that. Don't use plastic. Just, just, I don't know, be like one of those people who go to the store and they bring their own bag. I never do that, but I'd like to be one of those people because I know how bad it is. But I don't know, I just never do it. I, I know it's bad. I don't know why I'm, I, I shouldn't admit to this. How dare you? But I'm always just like, yeah, and then they're like, you you got to pay for plastic bags now to disincentivize you from using them. But I'm like, honestly, they're so cheap, they're basically free. So I'm not really sure who, like, what, it's, it sounds like just something to punish poor people, to be honest, rather than actually get people to stop using stuff. Because even poor people can afford plastic bags. There's nothing stopping, they're like, I don't know what it is in like regular, you know, here it's like, it's like three crowns, which is about 8p. That doesn't matter to anybody, does it? It's 8p. You can't even buy like a penny sweet for 8p anymore, I'm sure. Have you tried kill all the poor? Maybe you want to buy one of those weird strawberries. Only British people know what I'm talking about right now. I'm going to stop ranting about plastic bags, but it's just a f***ing con. The whole recycling thing. They might as well have just set fire to Santa's beard and pushed him down a well. Oh my god, that was such a long tangent, I have no idea what Danny's talking about. Oh, Quality Street's changing their wrapping. Oh my god, we're seven minutes in, basis. Six minutes, 42 seconds. How am I doing? How much has been edited out so far? I always like to find out when I watch these back. And it's like, ooh, six minutes, 30. Ten seconds of cuts. Not bad, whistle boy, not bad. This is just yet another sign that everything was far better in the olden days when children could stuff fireworks up their noses, there were more bobbies on the beat, everyone listened to proper music, and you could leave your front door wide open whilst you were away on holiday. Um, the music thing is is kind of bullshit though. I it, like I'm like I'm on the surface of things, I'm like, yeah, I agree with Danny. Music is 
fucking awful these days but then also so was it in the past and we somehow found good music to listen to like we do today it's not like this i was on a holiday with a mate of mine and we were listening like they're plugging my ipod to the car and we're driving along and he's like mate has your music change not changed since we were like kids and i'm like nah this is a spotify throwback <laughs> because there's always new good music even if it's like mostly dominated by um justin bieber and his absolute shot bell 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 and bell 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 and there's still loads of good music to listen to but if we're being sensible for just a second it's actually quite tricky to find something that was indisputably better in the olden days because there's usually a perfectly rational reason why something changed even if you don't personally approve of it on the whole it's very unlikely that a group of rational decision makers are going to sit round a table and say right how about we go about making this thing much worse for no logical reason at all <laughs> Those new eco-friendly quality street rappers might have lost their sparkle, but this move will put an end to two billion foil rappers ending up in landfill. Jesus Christ, UK, do we really eat two billion quality streets a year? That is mental. How many people are in the UK? Like, 60 million? Let's just round it down to 50 for easy maths. Carry the two changing as a Tom Guy's toner into a radioactive spider. That's like 40 quality streets each. For every man, woman, and child. That seems insane. I'd have like three toffee pennies and be like, I'm done. No, I don't want any more quality streets. Ugh. Monster Munch crisps might not taste as good since they've evolved from a fried snack into a baked snack, but they're now not quite so ridiculously unhealthy. I'm still annoyed that I'm not allowed to smoke in pubs these days, or barely anywhere on earth for that matter, but I begrudgingly accept that this has led to a long list of positive health benefits for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, like, I don't smoke. I, I smoke cigars occasionally, but I found, I'm not going to name it because <laughs> I don't want it to be ruined, but there is a secret. It's not secret. It's a, it's a, it's a bar. It's a, like a, a cigar bar in Prague where there's a couple of them, a couple, couple left or three places left that I can think of where there's a back room where you're just like, I'm going to sit, you go in, you know, I'm going to sit in the back and it's a cigar lounge and you can still smoke inside there and it's awesome. <laughs> The only reason that many of us tend to believe that we, things were better in the past is because we instinctively tend to focus on the good memories and discard the bad ones. When I enjoy a trip down memory lane with an old mate, we're not likely to reflect on the time we got randomly beaten up by a group of thugs while waiting in line at the cinema to watch Jingle All The Way. But surely we could think of at least a few things that were really better in the olden days without resorting to looking through a pair of rose-tinted lenses that were dropped into a bucket of golden nostalgia. I'm not entirely convinced, but let's give it a go. The World Wide Web. What are you all in the know? It's obviously better today. No one wants to go back to like Yahoo Answers when we have Quora. Although somehow I'm like, I, I like Quora. I have to say, I do like I do like it. I've got the app. I go on there. I read some interesting shit. But every every month it becomes more and more like Yahoo Answers. Where it's just like, there be crazy people on Quora. Um, or maybe that's just my algorithm feeding me more crazy people. Because I'm like, oh shit. I gotta read this. Nah, the internet was worse in the past, Danny. Pro you gotta, you're gonna, you, you, this is gonna be really hard for you. You don't know what you're talking about, do you? If we could rewind the clock back to the 1990s and early noughties, it wouldn't take long before we started screaming in frustration at the agonizingly slow speeds of dial-up internet connection. A typical one gigabyte file might take around 80 seconds to download today. <laughs> Danny, what connection are you on that takes a gigabyte file 80 seconds? Yeah, that's extremely slow, no? <laughs> but you'd be waiting close to four days back in 1998. There's also the issue that the internet was much more expensive back then and it was charged on a consumption basis and many of us didn't log in until after 6pm when it became a bit cheaper. Oh my god, I totally remember that. And using the internet also meant that you were hogging the telephone line and pissing off everyone else in the house who still felt that strange urge to receive calls from real people. But I do remember a time when slowly surfing the web felt like a bold step in a more colourful and diverse world of homebrew websites and you were never quite sure where you'd end up. Back then, everyone made their own wild and wacky DIY websites crammed with pulsating colours and unexpected noises and strange animations and anything else we could throw at the screen. We called ourselves webmasters and we thought we were smart because we'd learned a bit of HTML. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. I remember making like websites for like, a school project in IT or whatever. There was GeoCities. There was also another one which came along a bit later and was a bit easier to use. But I don't remember what it was called. But I mean, 
yeah, I did, we didn't use that. It wasn't HTML. It's like, why would we use HTML? We can use GeoCities website builder. It's just easier. One of the first online searches I ever conducted involved retro 8-bit video games, and this led me into an exciting new world of fan-made websites and passionate tributes, and even whole new remakes of classic titles which were produced as a labor of love. I could then easily get lost in old web rings, those hubs of similarly themed websites which had hooked up to provide a tempting portal into a wider community. This is a bit before me. This is a bit before my time, I think. I don't remember this. You jumped from one mad website into something even stranger. It felt like a thrilling journey down a glorious rabbit hole. These days, a similar Google search for retro 8-bit video games is more likely to throw up a string of sponsored links and carousels and buying guides and store locations, all of which trying to sell you mugs and fridge magnets and fanny packs based on your search query. I mean, agreed, but we're also very good at navigating these, right? If you've been on the internet for five minutes, you're like, okay, that's an ad, that's an ad, that's a sponsored link, that's someone pretending it's not an ad, but it is an ad, and then you're like, boom, look, content! Easy, it takes all of two seconds. Even if you do have the patience to scroll far enough down the page, you're only likely to visit the same handful of websites that we've all become trapped inside today. The Wikipedia entry, the social media page, the YouTube channel, and the most relevant press article blocked by a f***ing paywall. Yeah, it drives me mad. And I got no problem like paying for like journalism and stuff. I think that's fine. I, I don't do it because I, I, I just read BBC occasionally. I don't really follow the news that hard. But the problem is, it's like you Google search something and it's like, but I don't want to subscribe to like the f***ing Seattle Senator or whatever it's called. Wait, no, that's like a political thing. But like, you know, like a newspaper. And it's like, I'm not going to subscribe to your f***ing local newspaper because this is the one thing I want to read. Come on. Come on. I just want to see it. <laughs> Cached version. <laughs> please. At some point, our web experience just became completely homogenized, whilst the early days of the web felt like a step into... Oh, come on, prompter, let's go. One hour later. Into... The wild frontier! These days, it's more like a step into a corporate canteen with only about five bland options on the menu, many of which are too expensive. Perhaps the World Wide Web was always designed to adopt a standardized pattern, and maybe Google isn't pointing us to distinctive home-brewed websites because people simply can't be asked to make them anymore. Those creative webmasters of old died out and were replaced by administrators, and perhaps it's no surprise that Google search would ultimately become aggressively monetized. Oh boy, yes! And we love it business daddy <laughs> and google is essentially a thriving advertising business with the parent company alphabet pulling in around 209 billion dollars from ad revenue in 2021 a little bit a bit of which they cut off and they give to fact boy yes but not every innocent search query needs to be instantly converted into a potential shopping list which prioritizes paid results over more organic results part of the problem is that google search which generates about 8.5 billion searches a day holds about 92 percent of the market share in this lack of serious competition is unlikely to give Google much inclina inclination to stop battering you over the head with adverts. I'm so sorry about that. You could get YouTube Premium. I actually get more if you have YouTube Premium, which is nice. I mean, no pressure. But pref <laughs> no, I, I, YouTube Premium is really nice. I, I, I didn't know YouTube Premium for years. I'm kind of surprised that YouTube are like, look, okay, you get a million subscribers, we'll give you a... Uh, you can have YouTube Premium for free. No, I pay for YouTube Premium. <laughs> like a peasant. And the reason I got it is entirely because I couldn't f***ing stand another advert from f***ing Masterclass. F*** you, Masterclass. Like, and you're, this is how we braise a brisket in the south. And you're like, oh my god, stop. Aaron Sorkin teaches screenwriting. And it's like, oh what, Aaron Sorkin's gonna teach me how to be Aaron S And it's like, I'm gonna teach you how to do this. And then this, and then this is like, all right, so next thing it's gonna be, I'm gonna be writing the social network after watching Aaron Sorkin for 45 minutes. Please, Masterclass. Gordon Ramsay teaches cooking. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm so skeptical. Masterclass wanted to sponsorship, sponsor us, and I was like, nah, I don't want to. I don't think it's very good. <laughs> I, did, I did watch one. And I just, I just, I was just like, it's not very good. It's not, it's too expensive. And it's not very good. Sorry, Masterclass. Sorry. I'll do it for a lot of money. <laughs> no, I won't. Well, how much? Uh, <laughs> no, we're not getting sponsored by Masterclass anymore. My ad guy is going to be like, Simon, do you have to talk smack about like so many companies? And I'm like, yes, mate. It's kind of my brand. Would you tell Picasso to sell his guitars? Where else are you going to go to find out the Equality Street was launched? Oh, Google search, because it's so dominant. Currently only £5 a tin at Tesco. I just treated myself to a couple. That's a, that's cheap. Like a big tin of Quality Street for, th for £5? It's kind of a bargain. I might just give up and stick to using the basement library for my research, even though I can only find three dusty books on the shelves. Is anyone else here interested in hearing all about this history of communism? Everyone is, Danny.
everybody. Shrinking chocolates. There's no denying this one. You're generally getting a lot less chocolate for your money than you used to 20, 30, or even just 10 years ago. Chocolate shrinkflation is a thing, and almost everyone is at it. But not everyone has been entirely straight with us. Twix, Dairy Milk, and Terry's chocolate oranges have all shrunk by at least 10% in recent years. Have they really? Because that's one of those things that's like, wow, didn't these chocolate oranges used to be bigger when I was a kid? And everyone's like, oh no, Simon, you just used to be smaller. And it's like, no, it's actually shrunk. It was like this big. And it was hard. That big. And I hated it, if I'm being perfectly honest. Whilst Cadbury's cream eggs are now significantly smaller in the US. What? Something smaller in the US than in the UK? What's up? But the prices haven't reflected the slimming down of the products. One of my favorite chocolate bars from the UK is a Yorkie. Legends. Yorkies are so good. I haven't had a Yorkie in ages. They come with like biscuits and raisins in them. It's great. A proper chunky chocolate bar, which was famously marketed as a truck driver's snack and completely unsuitable for women. Oh my god, yeah. It used to say not for girls on it. That wouldn't fly these days, would it? Some of the tongue-in-cheek marketing slogans from the 80s and 90s included It's not for girls! Not available in pink! Don't feed the birds! <laughs> oh my god, Yorkie. <laughs> they probably wouldn't get away with that today, but they've certainly got away with lightening the truck driver's load. Yorkie bars used to be made up of six trunks, one containing each of the letters that spelled out the name Yorkie. Nowadays, the full name is spelled out in tiny letters on each chunk because there's not even enough chunks left to spell it out the traditional way. No way. And those chunks must be getting lighter as between 2002 and 2014, the weight of a Yorkie shrank from 70 grams to just 46 grams. Yeah, Yorkies were big and good. That's so small. Yeah, because I'm used to like a grip like this. With this thing, I had to do that. And that was just humiliating. You what? Still, at least girls could probably manage a full one now. Quality streets are at it too. Not content with just ditching the shiny wrappers, Nestle have also slashed the content by nearly a half since 2009. Well, no wonder only five quid because they're half the size. They've replaced the big metal tins with smaller plastic boxes and changed the way that the weight is measured on the packaging so that you might not notice. And don't get me started on wagon wheels. Oh, wagon wheels are rough though, Danny. I don't like those. The alleged shrinking size of these Commonwealth jam and marshmallow bit chocolate biscuits have been the source of fiery debate for decades and the manufacturers Burton's Foods even outright denied it at one point claiming contrary to popular belief wagon wheels have not actually got smaller most often our first wagon wheel experiences in childhood and hence our hands are much smaller <laughs> guys people are going to be able to look this up you know they're going to find one from the cupboard from back in the day there's going to be like historical information on the size of wagon wheels uh, any you know any half brain journalist is going to be able to Figure this out, Burtons. And if memory serves, you're from the Daily Planet, yeah? <laughs> nice try, Burtons, but wagon wheels are actually 12% smaller and noticeably thinner than they were in 2006. Some manufacturers, such as Mars and Unilever, have claimed that the reduction in size is all about cutting calories and promoting responsible consumption. Oh, come on! Just f***ing say it's about money! It's fine! You're a business! No one cares! We all know that it's about money! So why do you have to lie about it being good for us? It's idiotic. It just makes you look like a piece of shit, allegedly Unilever. I like it. It's fun. It makes my dick hard. And obviously, like, it's to do with promoting responsible consumption. The last thing f***ing Unilever wants is responsible consumption. They just want as much consumption as possible because that's good for shareholders. I don't have a problem with any of this. I just have a problem with the f***ing lying. It's just stupid. What? And I know it's probably not even Unilever's fault. It's probably the super expensive PR firm they've hired. But that PR firm is run by people who, like, their brains just need to cook a little bit longer or something. Because, Jesus. It's, it just pisses me off. <laughs> Why am I so mad about this? I just don't like the, the bullshit. Daddy, chill. Instead of trying to make out that they're doing us all a favor, they should perhaps admit that the real reason for shrinkage is the higher demand for cocoa combined with a gradual decrease in cocoa yield. Also money! It's also money, because they could just pay more. It's just money. It's like, okay, so the cocoa yield, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, obviously, if you paid more for cocoa, you could get more cocoa, and some other country that's poorer wouldn't get it. That's how business works. 
it's money. They either have to raise their prices dramatically or offer the customer less for the same price. Maybe they've adopted the right approach under difficult circumstances. James Brown, a partner at the consulting firm Simon Kusher, points out, you don't say, I want to consume 120 grams of chocolate. You say, I want a chocolate bar that costs 75p or less. I'm not sure, though. If I only got offered barely a mouthful of chocolate for my 75p, I'd just give up on the idea and become a heroin addict instead. I have no idea how much chocolate bars are. I knew how much they were in the past because I used to work in a store that sold them, and that was like 10 years ago. I'm kind of surprised that you can get a chocolate bar for under a quid. <laughs> Am I insane? It's been a long time. Air travel. We're making a turbulent landing on dodgier ground with this one, but bear with me before you conclude that I've lost the plot. No, I think people often think this, like air travel was better in the past. I mean, not safety-wise, obviously. <laughs> it was much more dangerous in the past. But we used to have legroom and shit. But the problem is, it's like you can have legroom now. You just have to pay for business or first. And it's more expensive. But you know what was also more expensive? Air travel in the past! <laughs> My most recent flight turned out to be a deeply unpleasant experience. The airport was particularly chaotic, and it often wasn't clear what I was even supposed to do next. But if I accidentally stepped out of line or took a wrong step forward in the confusion, the airport staff would scream at me to get back as if I was a prisoner jumping the queue for a haircut. <laughs> and after hanging around the airport for hours, messing about with my liquid toiletries, taking off my shoes and belt, going through body scanners, getting frisked, pausing for photographs, and getting shouted at every 10 minutes, I was eventually squeezed into a tiny... Yeah, man. F***ing flying sucks. I'm flying... Who am I flying with? I can't even remember. Maybe it's EasyJet. Maybe it's BA. God, if it's BA. I don't think it's BA. Otherwise, I wouldn't be dreading it quite as much as I am. But I'm flying um, to the UK on Friday. By the time this goes out, I'll have already done this trip. And uh, it's with my two young kids and my wife. And it's just going to be like, Ah, oh, do we have to? <laughs> It's like the planes and everything at the airports. Prague Airport is actually extremely nice because it's like, it somehow else serves this massive city, but it's quite small. And obviously I know London's a lot bigger, but there are like nine airports or whatever in London. But Heathrow is always just such a like, oh, for fuck's sake, you got to like take a train to go somewhere. It's just unbelievably massive. And it's just a bit of a nightmare. As I was later served up a plate of unidentifiable microwaved slop dosh, I paused to reflect on how different it must have felt during the golden age of flying back in the 1950s. There was none of this mucking about back then. You just casually wandered up to the gate whenever you were ready, armed with your liquid toiletries and your flick knife. <laughs> your family could even accompany you to the gate to wave you off. There was no waiting in line, no checkpoints, barely any luggage restrictions, and you didn't even have to show your ID. Once on board, it felt as if you'd stepped onto an arena of glamour. Passengers used to dress up in suits and posh frocks. There were bigger seats, a lot more room to stretch out your legs in comfort, and you'd be served proper gourmet food such as lobster and grilled filet mignon washed down with a bottle of vintage wine. Blimey, you could even smoke yourself silly. It does sound awesome. <laughs> it sounds awesome, except for all the people with flick knives and the danger, and I'm sure it was pretty pretty loud and uh, it was mental expensive. So what went wrong? Well, as with security first began to emerge in the 1970s, it was noticed that planes tended to adopt a nasty habit of getting hijacked all the bloody time <laughs> between 90. <laughs> How are we going to stop this hijacking? I don't know. How about we ask people if they've got knives on them? <laughs> That's a good start, John. <laughs> between 1968 and 1972 alone, there were no less than 130 hijackings of American planes, not just around the world. 130 hijackings in four years in America alone. And of course, the security was dramatically stepped up even more following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. There's a massive pain in the ass, but it's helping to keep everyone safe. But President Carter's 1978 Air Deregulation Act also played a part too. Before then, it was the federal government who set the ridiculously expensive ticket fees which only the wealthy could afford. Make that white and wealthy. You didn't see many people of color at airports apart from the baggage porters, and in fact, African Americans weren't even allowed to work at airports until the 1960s. I'm always just like, when I hear, like, 1960s, it's like, that was like 60 years ago. It all seems so late, America. During this period, when all airlines were forced into charging the same high prices, that to create distinctive customer value in other areas, such as comfy, spacious surroundings and gourmet menus and dancing bears. But the Deregulation Act was designed to ramp up competition between airlines and allow them to set their own cheaper prices for the first time. This led the airlines into dropping the fancy frills and focusing instead on providing the cheapest possible tickets by shaving down seat sizes, cramming in a as many passions as they could manage, and dishing up cheap and crap food. Some might argue that the golden age is a myth and that there's never been a better time to fly. It's certainly a lot cheaper. Taking inflation into account, the price of a ticket has dropped by about 50% over the last 40 years, allowing even peasants in pajamas to take to the skies. 
Yeah, it's very upsetting, isn't it? I, I mean, look, I'm as disappointed as the next guy that peasants are now allowed to fly. Especially when they wear pajamas. Bananas in pajamas are coming down the stairs. You also get to your destination much quicker rather than having to endure a four day flight from Sydney to London. <laughs> Good lord. And there's greater availability of flights going to far more places, so you're not left waiting for a week if you missed your plane. Oh, and you can also choose your own in flight entertainment from the video screens mounted into the chairs in front of you instead of having to squint to see whatever random film was being blurrily projected onto the bulkhead. I remember flying as a kid. And they had that projector at the front of the plane that everyone was watching. And I'm like, what the... I mean, it seemed amazing at the time. And then I went on a plane that, like, the next plane I went on, I was also a kid and had TVs in the back of the seats. And I was like, oh my lord. And now there's a TV in the back of the seat. I don't even watch it because I got my iPad with me. <laughs> But I suppose if you were white, wealthy, and not in a particular hurry, the flying experience was a lot more pleasant in the golden age, assuming you weren't too fussy about the plane being hijacked. Yeah, but now if you're like, <clears throat> well, you'd have to be white, but like wealthy and not in a particular hurry, and then you could just fly business, can't you? And it's really nice. It's kind of like it was in the past. There's good food. There's lots of space. The staff are like reasonably polite to you. <laughs> it's just better. And so you can have it like in the past. Still, you can't argue that commercial supersonic travel was better in the olden days on the grounds that it actually existed. Concord may have been a completely unviable business model, but it was unusual in the sense that when the only commercial aircraft capable of traveling twice the speed of sound were retired in 2003, there was nothing else waiting in the wings to replace it. That's true, supersonic travel was better in the past. I don't know about the airline thing, I don't buy that, Danny, or your internet thing, I don't buy that either. But I do buy the Concorde being better, although it was super expensive. It was like it was like ten grand to go to New York, and it's like twice as fast. And I'd be like, and, and not comfortable. I'd be like, I'd rather go comfortable slower in first and still save money. And I think that's what everyone realized and why Concord is an unviable business model. Help me, I'm poor. No. Although companies such as Boom are promising the imminent next generation of supersonic travel, yeah, everyone's been promising this forever. Anyone who missed the last supersonic flight has been left waiting for 20 years for the next one. The future. Whenever science fiction offered us a tantalizing glimpse into the future, we often used to be enthralled by the vision of a brighter tomorrow with talking robots, rocket ships, hoverboards, diamond cities, teleportation, no incurable disease, and neon signs that actually worked. Shots fired, shots fired, I'm taking cover. But today's fictional vision of the future looks considerably more bleak and is far more likely to include the last gasp of a disease-ridden, zombie-infested civilization on a post-apocalyptic Earth as the remaining survivors, survivors fight over the last few toffees from that last tin of Quality Street. What, now they're fighting over the toffees? Oh, because they're the last ones. Danny, the toffees are the best ones. What are you smoking? How did the future get so grim? Of course, there are exceptions to every rule, and one of the biggest sci-fi franchises of all time, Star Trek, still enjoys a broadly positive outlook today. And we've always had dystopian science fiction. Way back in 1895, H.G. Wells popularized the concept of fictional time travel in the time machine by showing us a future with brutal inequality and division between the classes. More recently, the cinema has occasionally thrown up a vivid dystopian future along the lines of Soylent Green, Blade Runner, and it was a short summer, Charlie Brown. That was that. I've never heard of it. It was a short summer. And I, I guess it's a Charlie Brown thing. Okay. I don't know Charlie Brown. I don't watch that. I haven't seen that. But over the last decade or so, notably since the release of the first Hunger Games movie in 2012, we've seen an unprecedented spike in dystopian science fiction, which has painted almost the entire genre in relentless gloom and misery and hopelessness. Some people might suggest that it's all about constructing an engaging plot. I don't know, Star Trek's always managed an engaging plot, and it's like, look at the bright, great future where everyone's cool and like, you know? Diseases are cured, there's no money. It's a utopia. It's all the other races that are f***ing us up. <laughs> <That's racist! laughs> if you set a book or movie in a peaceful utopian world where everybody gets along and every problem is solved, you're not going to squeeze much dramatic tension out of it. You need a disruptive and unpredictable setting to drive the plot forward and ramp up human conflicts. But I wouldn't necessarily agree, as this seems to imply, that any non-dystopian setting must be, by definition, a blissful utopian setting, which isn't the case at all. Rare exceptions like Star Trek manage to depict largely positive and better futures, but within a narrative where there's still natural scope for drama and conflict and adventure. The human race may have figured out how to 
invent sliding doors that make cool whooshing sounds, but that doesn't mean that we can retire to paradise just yet. Future's now, old man. I completely get that the medium of science fiction has often been used to tell cautionary tales which hold up a mirror to the modern world to offer stark warning of the future. Even that original 1895 trip in H.G. Wells' The Time Machine showed us the disastrous destination to which we were headed unless the human race booked its ideas up. But this always went hand in hand with hope. Back in the 1950s, celebrated writers such as Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, and Ray Bradbury were keen to depict a more optimistic view of the future. They blew our minds with often eerily accurate predictions of some of the incredible technological advancements that the human race will take for granted in a more scientifically advanced age. Arthur C. Clarke himself noted, One of the biggest roles of science fiction is to prepare people to accept the future without pain and to encourage a flexibility of mind. But new science fiction from the last decade is far more likely to depict futuristic, overcrowded shitholes populated by zombies and tramps and rogue computers and viruses and governed over by murderous cutthroat corporations. A world tomorrow in which everyone is out to deceive you, fleece you, or kill you. The concern here is that those progressive writers from the 50s have evolved into the new Luddites. Science fiction is now a medium in which we're told that every new technological development and every progressive step is only leading civilization deeper into the pit of hell, and there's nothing we can do about it. So enjoy life while you still can. Yeah, it's a bit like, I don't know, you look on Netflix and you're like, oh, it's just like another another set in a horrible future thing. I just watched that new Resident Evil, which I enjoyed. I was really sick. I had like the flu a couple of months ago, and I was watching that, and I watched it all in like a week. And then I was like, oh, God. It was It was like good and bad at the same time, if you know what I mean. You don't know what you're talking about, do you? Is it really too difficult to imagine a world in which mankind continues on a bold journey on the same path of progress that we've been navigating for the past few hundred thousand years? At this moment in time, the future looks considerably worse than it did in the olden days. And one final point to consider for all those people desperate to turn back the clock to a better time. No matter how far you travel back, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, there's one thing you'll never be able to escape from. Misplaced nostalgia. Even back in the days of ancient Greece, everyone was just constantly moaning about how things just ain't as good as they used to be. The human condition. <laughs> so, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. I'm coming for you and your family. That's... don't... oh god, I'm definitely... <laughs>